Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we are diving into the second problem of personality typology systems, an observer bias. Yes, biases are everywhere, even in the systems that help us understand ourselves better. To kick things off, let's take a trip back to 1904 and meet clever Hans. Wilhelm von Austin, a German mathematics teacher, trained his horse to do such things as counting people and objects, telling time, spelling, reading, and even solving arithmetic problems. Imagine asking a horse a math question and watching it tap out the answer with its hoof. Sounds unbelievable, right? Oh my God, what a clever horse. Horses are really amazing creatures. Sure they are, my grandfather's horse was great at opening twist locks all over this table. From Austin showcased his remarkable horse throughout Germany. And by the way, never charged admission. People were amazed and Hans became an international sensation, with his talents even making headlines in the New York Times. Hans' fame caught the attention of the German Education Board, which appointed the commission to investigate. A psychologist Karl Stumm formed a panel of 13 experts, known as a Hans Commission. This commission consisted of a veterinarian, a circus manager, a cavalry officer, a number of school teachers, and even the director of the Berlin Zoological Gardens. After a sore investigation, the commission concluded that there were no tricks involved in Hans' performance. Seriously? A horse that was a mass genius? Now it's getting interesting. But not everybody was convinced. A skeptical German psychologist, Oskar Pfungst, decided to investigate further. He discovered that Hans still could answer correctly even if Om Austin was not the one asking the questions, which ruled out the fraud. However, Hans only got the answers right when he could see the questionnaire and when Om Austin knew the answer. When Om Austin didn't know the answer, Hans was as clueless as any other horse. What Oskar Funks discovered was a classic case of observer bias. It turned out that Hans wasn't doing math at all. Instead, he was picking up on a subtle clue from his owner. I thought so anyways. When Hans got close to the right number of taps, from Austin unknowingly would change his posture, facial expression or even his breathing. Hans had learned to stop tapping when he saw those clues. So Hans wasn't actually solving mass problems, but reacting to his owner's unintentional signals. If even Hans was not a mathematical genius, he still was incredible at picking up signals and reactions of his owner. How many people can do that? It's not that horses are not clever in the old way, it just horses can't do math. As a math teacher, Wilhelm von Austin really wanted to believe that they could, and this desire influenced his objectivity. And now let's fast forward to 1963 and let's have a look at the experiment made by Robert Rodenthal and Kermit Fode at the University of North Dakota. Here's what happened. Rosenthal and Fode gave a group of 12 psychology students a bunch of rats. 60 to be exact. Some of the rats were labeled maze bride, meaning they were specially bred to be good at solving mazes, and others maze dull, meaning they were not at all good at it. Over the five days, the students were in experiments where rats had to navigate T-shaped maze. The goal was to always run towards the dark side of the maze where rats would get a reward. Of course, the sides were randomly switched. 
The students were noting how often the red chose the correct side and how fast they completed the maze. And sure enough, maze bright red seems to crash it, making fewer mistakes and finishing maze faster. Yeah, that was obvious. Of course, reds bred to be better at solving mazes should perform better. That's simple science. But here is a twist. The subjects of the experiment were not the reds, but the psychology students themselves. There were no maze bright or maze dial reds at all. All reds were actually the same. They were randomly split into two groups. Okay. I think no red is the same. They all have their unique personalities. Yeah, but they still were all randomly split. Nobody looked at their personalities. So what happened then? That was just another example of observer bias. The students expected the maze bright reds to perform better and the maze dull reds to perform worse. And that's exactly what they saw. But it wasn't at all because of any real difference in reds. It was about the students' subtle biases. They seem to treat reds differently. They may have hit the stopwatch a bit later for the dull reds, or they were just more focused on the bright ones. In the end, the students unknowingly created what looked like a real difference in performance. But it was totally false. This study is a perfect example of how our expectations can shape outcomes if even we think we've been objective. And for our final example, let's talk about the BBC's Girls Toys vs. Boys Toys experiment. In this experiment, different adults were asked to play with several small children and give them some toys. The observers noticed that the toys the adults gave to the children aligned with the traditional gender stereotypes – dolls and soft toys for the girls, and cars, robots, building blocks for the boys. Also, the girls were not proposed the toys that teach spatial awareness or physical confidence. After that, the adults were asked why they chose those particular toys. They came with such answers as I just took what was around or the kid liked it the best. Actually, I had brothers and they were interested in boy toys only from the early age. However, at the beginning of the experiment, the clothing of the children was swapped. The boys were dressed in traditional girls' clothes and the girls as boys. The experiment revealed how adults unconsciously steer children towards certain types of toys based on their perceived gender, without even realizing how their own biases influences the development of children's skills interests, and even career inspirations from the early age. So, what all these examples tell us? The observer bias is a tendency to see what we want to see, rather than what's really there. Whether it's a horse tipping out the answer, kids playing with their toys, or rats navigating the maze, our own expectations can seriously skew the data. What does all that have to do with personality typologies? For example, if a person, even a certified typologist, believes someone is introverted based on certain behaviors, vibe, or simply resembles somebody else, this person might unconsciously interpret ambiguous behaviors as a further evidence of introversion, even if those behaviors could be consistent with other personality traits or give certain chosen behaviors more attention in order to validate his or her position. Also on the stage of creating typology and gathering data to support the theory, observer bias may lead to a reinforcement of stereotypes and oversimplified and inaccurate categorizations. So the question is, how can we avoid that? First, being aware of observer bias is a key. We also need standardized methods for collecting data, 
and minimizing expectations of personal involvement. The goal is to make sure that the results reflect true personality and not just observer's preconceived notion. That's it for today's deep dive into observer bias. Never stop questioning and stay pink curious. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe, so you don't miss out on the future content. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in my next video.